it and it i feel like it functions much like the government it takes eons to get anything accomplished sure. so um there's like red tape and stuff kind of holding us back we got to get pricing they want contracts signed by whatever lab we use and um so it's just it's kind of a mess and it's taking forever they hoped to have everything ready last october and it's not really close so wow. um yeah it's it's like most things you, you get enough uh, enough people in a room all of the opinions start to collide against each other and nothing gets done yeah, yeah. so and i don't have a lot of control over it because i'm not in administration so i don't have a lot of pull or right. i might be more motivated to like push things along not everyone is so it just goes as quickly as it goes which isn't very fast so right. we're getting there <laughs> good good but eventually we do that is a goal of ours to be providing that service yeah you know the more and more skills that we acquire the more we need the lab to help us out that's you know and it's becoming harder and harder i don't know if you guys are starting to notice a very significant um, downturn I, I don't want to say in quality of lab work but frustrations of working with the labs you know we can imagine that the same labor crunch that's affecting us in our workplace with assistance is also affecting these larger labs you know there was a time when most dentists their lab was a guy in his basement down the road you know there were this net there was a network of um, solo lab practitioners and the lab industry consolidated to what you see today where there's larger and larger players with more and more resources uh, but comes with what comes with that is a high a high degree of loss of quality so we've had you know struggles for years with different labs we find a good lab and then their best technician who we loved you know retires or moves on to a different lab so on and so forth so one of our long-term goals is to kind of bring that in house somehow some way whether that's a 3d printer milling units having a lab technician on site one of my uh, mentors Dan Armstrong who I'll actually reference in our talk tonight uh, he had his own lab in his office and I think other dentists sent to him uh, or sent to his lab to have some work done um, so the idea of having a, your own dental lab within your dental practice as long as you're large enough to support the work is definitely something that uh, is possible so we're um, when, when I worked up in northern Maine at Academy Dental when Dr. Desjardins Norma Desjardins was running the practice um, I, it still works out there's a private lab that was right above them it was amazing and it oh, does wow. work out because what would happen is you'd have people maybe with some modeling on their front teeth and they needed a crown and you really wanted an aesthetic match they would come down they would see the patient themselves that's great and then they could take whatever information they needed with them they could try it they could go right back up to the lab make some modifications come down it was awesome there's i mean so many huge benefits to having them in your building yeah some of you guys may remember Dow Lampkin. He owned uh, Port City Dental Lab. Unfortunately, he passed away from a prion disease several years ago. Uh, but he was, he spent the most of his, well, I want to say most of his week. Uh, there were several days during the week where he'd go out with his porcelain oven and he would do bisque try-ins with patients. So he would come to you rather than the patient go to him, um, which was valuable because I've sent patients for custom shade matches to labs and they come back just as bad as had I sent A2. To the lab on the lab slip. Um, so the reality is, I think there's always, it, it helps to have our involvement. So you had this opportunity where the lab technician would come down, but you were still in the room when they were making the decisions. You know, we would think that a lab technician could see, you know, a little hypocalcification on the incisal ledge of number eight. Um, they might just be looking to get the shade right, not necessarily uh, make this into a Picasso, but that's what we want because our name is on it. Uh, so yeah, that's, what a great opportunity. I, I wish I had had that at some point. Um, but that's where we're heading. You know, having the ability to have somebody on site is, is invaluable. Uh, I had once heard that there are parts of Europe, I don't know if it was Italy, where patients seeking high-end dental care will actually go to the lab technicians first. They'll find the best lab technician, and then the lab technician will contract with a dentist that they trust to do the work. 
Uh, because at the end of the day, it's the lab technician that's actually making the tooth look like a tooth. So I thought that was interesting. I don't know how true that was. I've probably made it into a story that never actually existed, but um, the reality is the lab technician has to be very, very understanding about what we want. And I think in the, in the near future, and I have a presentation on the anterior aesthetic crown uh, is something that we should really take a closer look at. What is the workflow from impression to delivery when it involves a high degree of characterization and you don't have a lab technician upstairs or somebody like Dow who came to the office. Uh, there, there is a way to do it. It's using photography in a very unique way to capture a whole bunch of different light settings so that you can send this to a really good lab technician. They don't need to be there because they literally have the tooth under all different lighting conditions that you've sent them. And we found that very valuable. We have a lab, Arrowhead Lab, that has master ceramists that do a really good job of delivering high quality aesthetic outcomes uh, from photography alone. Uh, so yeah, we'll go over that. That's something that I, I love talking about. Uh, it's something I, I still need to learn more about. Um, the single central incisor is always and uh, forever will be the hardest thing we do in dentistry because there are so many parameters that go, go into it. All right, well, thank you, Kristen, for that. I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started with the topic for today. I'm sure we'll have some more people coming on. All right, so I'm gonna assume everybody can hear me. Uh, the topic of today is called the segue. Uh, so there's two different conversations I wanna have today. One is piggybacking up off of our conversation over the last two weeks about comprehensive treatment planning and how we can take advantage of emergency situations to convert the patient into a comprehensive dental patient, whatever that means. It doesn't mean everybody gets a full mouth rehab. It just means that we look at the patient from a 10,000 foot view, not only the problem they present with on emergency. So I thought it was important, what does segue actually mean? It's an uninterrupted transition from one piece of music or film scene to another. Um, but we can think of segue as a transition, an uninterrupted transition from one situation in the patient's life, the dental emergency, to another, which is the comprehensive dental treatment plan. So that's what we're gonna talk a little bit about today. But I think before we do that, we need to solve this problem. The patient comes in with this situation. We've all had it. Patient shows up on Thursday at 4.30, and as I <laughs> painted the picture of a story uh, in the email, this patient has a hot date on Saturday night. Uh, we've all had the situations where the patients have something that's super important. What do we do here? You know, this is a, a complex situation. It might look like something that we can solve uh, in a short amount of time with some degree of predictability, uh, but there's a lot of red flags here that give us the um, the insight that this is going to be a little bit more complicated than just making a flipper and Essex retainer, both of which require lab time. So what we're going to talk about today is alternative solutions to solving this in a temporary manner. We'll talk a little bit about permanent solutions here. There's something called the socket shield technique, which is more of a surgical technique, but I, I want everybody to be aware of it because uh, it's becoming more and more relevant in the dental community. and if a general dentist hears that an oral surgeon or a surgeon, a general dentist, whoever did the surgery left a piece of the tooth in, um, our conclusion is gonna be that is a crappy surgeon. Well, the socket shield is an intentional remnant, uh, an intentional leaving over of the tooth in order to preserve the buccal plate. We'll talk about that. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about this, this particular patient, um, but let's start with what do we do immediately? So you really don't have any time to, to make a flipper unless your in-house lab has the resources to do it. If it was a Monday and the patient had an entire week, you could send them to a denturist. For those of you that are, that are on this, that practice in Maine, we have that opportunity uh, to send this to a denturist lab and they could fabricate something immediately. Uh, they would probably charge handsomely for it. Anytime there's an emergency uh, aspect to treatment planning, there's always a cost 
associated with that. But this is a Thursday afternoon. What do we do? Well, we could talk a lot about whether or not that's a restorable tooth or not. Um, let's just say that dark area that we see in this area here uh, is not a crack. Let's just assume that's just discoloration from the photo. Um, Dr. Phillips sent this to me. Um, it's not important whether that's a crack or not. Let's just assume for the sake of the conversation that this was intact. It was previously endotreated. And the only thing that happened was the post that was in there had broken off and the core came out with it. And there wasn't a whole lot of decay associated with this. Well, one of the things we can do, and this may be obvious to some, but as somebody who has employed young associates over the years, um, this isn't obvious to most. You can do a post and a core and make it look like a tooth in an hour. Uh, there's really no reason you couldn't do that. Now, are you going to have a feral? No. One might argue that, you know, in dental school, we were taught never to do a post and core unless we had a feral for the future crown. Well, as something to get the patient by, who's to say we couldn't just put a new post in and then build up around that using good bonding techniques? Maybe we pack some core to get some good isolation so that we, we don't have any micro leakage. Uh, but I've done this many times, so much that I get patients back two to three to four years later and they're like, all right, I'm ready for my crown. And it's like, well, no, we have other things we need to do. I do try to educate the patient so that they understand that what I'm gonna be doing is a short-term thing, but it sometimes lasts a while, just putting a post and a core around it where there's no interface between the core and the tooth other than what you see right here. Obviously you have the post. Anybody want to chime in on, on that kind of solution? Have they done it? Has it worked? Has it not worked? Is it a novel idea for some? I haven't done it directly that way in the front. I've done it where just bonding it to the neighboring teeth to make it look like a tooth is there rather than the root surface. Yeah. Um, yeah. Bonding the other times at our office, we have the the Cerex so we can mill out a resin crown, which then you could shove a post in there and just get something very temporary in place. But I like the idea of just do the post and make it a really big build up for the, the meantime. Yeah. Yeah. Ha having milling would definitely help. You know, you could probably control the aesthetics a little bit better. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there's lots of different ways to be able to solve this, uh, this particular thing. Bonding to the adjacent teeth is definitely something we'll talk about. Uh, but just keep in mind that it's okay to do things that we were told never to do in a short-term manner. I don't know about you, but when I graduated dental school, everything that the faculty said, I took as dogma. In other words, never not do this, or never do this, sorry. Uh, this is a situation where, you know, for all intents and purposes, that tooth is probably coming out. Uh, why not use it as an anchor in the meantime? So always thinking outside the box is really the goal here. Uh, well, let's reserve the conversation about bonding to the adjacent teeth for a little bit later, only because that's really where I think the answer is. Uh, I think it's a wonderful solution. But let's maybe have a conversation about how this patient ended up here in the first place. So we can assume that this is a crown, uh, good translucency, but it just looks too yellow to be a natural tooth, especially compared to their uh, more gray, grayish hued natural teeth. Do we have any idea what might have caused this? If he was a hockey player, sure, but let's just say we don't know his history. All we know is his dental presentation. What possibly could have led this? His occlusion. His occlusion. So what, definitely, what specifically about the occlusion? The overbite. So a deep bite. You know, patients who have deep bites, they spend more time in what we call entrapment. Entrapment is a, a term we use in the practice all the time because it's really relevant with everybody. Um, Dawson used to call um, resolution of entrapment long centric. Essentially, it's creating a little bit of space between the facials of the lowers or the incisal facial line angle of the lowers and the linguals of the uppers. If there's not enough space there, the muscles don't like that and we end up getting loss of posterior teeth. 
We also see entrapment a lot in TMD patients where we, we actually create long centric. We create the space between those upper and lower teeth in MIP. So it's important that when we talk about space, we, we know what static position we're talking about. In this case, we're talking about MIP. The front teeth should not touch. And I, I know that's contrary to most, um, at least where I went to school, we were taught you know, equal contacts all the way around. And then you get lines in the front when you get mutually protected uh, occlusion happening. Uh, but in reality, we have found patients are a lot more stable when their front teeth don't touch. Well, this guy, for whatever reason, was touching in the anterior. How do we know that? Well, we can see a wear facet right on number 24. Well, this wear facet looks like it's pointing right to the center of this tooth. So it would stand to reason, just like previously stated, that this is an occlusal problem. Why is that important? Super obvious question that we have to get right. Why is that important? Happen again. Yeah, we don't want it to happen again. So I, I will often tell patients, look, what, what you did to your natural tooth, uh, Dr. Lopez used to say, I can't do better than what God gave you. you know, I'm not saying you have to bring God into the equation with your patients, but I will often say, I can't do better than nature. So if we're going to build something, we have to account for the fact that this guy's out of place. So the beginning of this talk was the segue. This is what the segue is. It's the conversation of you have a problem right now and what better time to have the discussion about comprehensive care than right now? Because the patient is in uh, an emotional state. They're freaking out. They have their hot date on Saturday. They don't want to look like this. This isn't about getting the sign on the dotted line for a $40,000 treatment plan. Uh, this guy needs a $40,000 treatment plan um, if he decides he wants implants. Uh, there's lots of options that will be very serviceable to this guy short of that. But the goal isn't to have that conversation with him today. It's to get him to understand that this is just the beginning. You have a problem. What I'm going to be doing today is only taking care of the result of the problem, not the problem itself. Now to the patient, the problem is the missing tooth. To us astute dentists who love occlusion, the problem is that. You have to get the patient to understand that at that point in time, because what you're gonna build here is likely to suffer the same demise that the natural tooth did, even the temporary, uh, because of this particular situation here. So we've all done it, or I, I, I'd assume we've all done it, where we go to restore the situation and we run out of room. Why do we run out of room? Well, the facial surface of this solution, the facial surface of this future tooth is defined by the facial surface of the adjacent tooth. Meanwhile, the lingual surface is defined by this tooth here. Well, many of our materials maybe don't perform very well with that thickness in mind. So we have to create space somehow, and that's where comprehensively we need to take a closer look at things. Uh, but it's, it's obvious to say it now, but the number of times that I've missed this opportunity, so if it's happened to me, I'm just gonna assume it happens to others, we see this patient on emergency, we do not look at this tooth right here. I promise you there's almost always a tooth like this below a tooth like this. It, it, it's crazy how when I started looking at these things, I started seeing it. You know, it's kind of like the analogy when you buy a blue truck, you start realizing how many blue trucks are on the road. Um, your eyes open up and you start seeing things that you never saw before. So that's the whole point of this is Let's keep our eyes open when we see a problem like this. What other things could have led to it? So definitely occlusion, the deep bite. Uh, he likely has entrapment, which has led to muscle dysfunction, which caused uh, posterior tooth overload. Um, I would venture to say he's got an airway problem because of where his tongue is um, kind of spilling over the alveolar ridge. Uh, th there's lots here. Uh, before we talk about other solutions, are there some other things that we see here that might paint the picture for us to have a conversation with this patient about him needing something a little bit greater than what he's had in the past? To me, number eight sticks out like a sore thumb. Like I actually look at eight almost <laughs> more than nine <laughs> personally. Yeah. So I would definitely, and also like you said, and I always say this to patients, like if we're doing a front tooth, what does the other front tooth look like? Because it's so hard to match 
if you want it to be picture perfect, doing them at the same time would be better anyway. And it definitely could look better than that. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like a headlight. <laughs> you know, the incisal edge might be a little bit long. You know, this was the only photo that Chad had sent because it was more of an emergency situation, but it would be interesting to work up this case using the facially generated treatment planning concept. Uh, it's very possible that this tooth is actually a little bit long in the patient's face. And I'm only looking at kind of the canine right here. It might be close, uh, but these are things that we need to look at when we're comprehensively treating the patient. The goal of this is to use the opportunity for the patient that's in an emergency state, never seen the patient before, and convert them to a comprehensive dental patient. Is Chad, are you here? So Chad Phillips, this was his patient. Uh, yeah, you wanna, I'm here. You wanna shed some light on, so Chad did this, um, by the way, he segued the patient to uh, comprehensive care, the patient's coming in for diagnostics. Do you want to shed a little bit of light on how this guy, how this happened? Yeah. Um, so I saw him last Thursday, I believe up in Naples. Um, and yeah, he's new to the practice. He had been going to a different dentist somewhere in the area. I don't know the name, but, um, he was looking for something new. Um, and so he had this happen. So this is actually, um, the tooth broke off a long time ago, um, but his previous dentist elected to keep the root in there and make a flipper for him. Um, so he's been living with a flipper for number nine for uh, probably a few weeks or months or so. Um, but the flipper is now broken, and so now that's why um, uh, it is another emergency. So um, he did mention that he had, uh, or he, he had run into a pole as a kid and knocked those two teeth um and that's what started their lifetime of dental treatment yeah. um so there was a trauma um at least initiating factor to it sure. and then the occlusion probably just um you know kept the problems coming back but um uh he had also lost his partials in a recent move um or his lower partial so um he was having a lot of trouble eating as well so um, with the broken front tooth, the lost lower partial, he knew, he knew, he kind of knew already that he was in a state where he needs to, um, uh, put some time and money into his, into his mouth. So, yeah. So you sent him and, down, down to Buxton for, for diagnostics. For those who don't know what diagnostics yep. is, uh, we have an appointment where, uh, we see a patient like this who needs a higher level of care, a higher level of treatment planning than we can do in the new patient exam. We get a CAT scan, uh, a full series of spear type photos where we essentially capture a photo of every tooth um, in occlusion, protrusion, so on and so forth. We have a video that's taken that has the patient function so that we can see where their mandible likes to live. Uh, we do an itero scan, so we have a digital representation of their, of their teeth. Uh, for some patients, we do a face bow. Some patients, we do a centric bite record, some patients we do a phonetic bite, sometimes there's neuromuscular involvement. So that diagnostic appointment is purely just data acquisition. Um, Chantel is our uh, assistant that does that. She spends an hour with the patient. She also, you know, spends that hour kind of building the value of what we call proactive care. You know, we don't want patients to show up like this any longer. And we know enough in dentistry that we can prevent these things from happening, you know, or at least lower the risk dramatically. Um, so yeah, Chad, this was a good one. I, when you sent it, I said, yeah. this is, this is one we gotta, gotta keep moving forward. Was there anything else about the case other than he's coming back? Um, yeah. So number eight is an implant crown. So ah. it was the trauma to the both teeth. Um, and so he said the implant was placed a few years ago and he, he doesn't seem to be concerned with the aesthetics of it. He said it's doing fine for him, but I didn't, I didn't probe that far. Um, so, um, the only other consideration, so the flipper had broken recently and he used, he's one of those people who tried to patch it himself. He like yeah. drilled a little hole in the flipper, put a little like metal stick thing, super glued the, the metal stick to it and then found some like resin material to try to, to make a tooth out of it. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. DIY dentistry. Exactly. Only, only in Maine. Um, mm -hmm. Labani had brought up a, a recent situation somewhat similar. Uh, 
I believe it was a complete denture and the, the tooth just keeps falling off. We've, we've all had this happen. Um, we have dentures that, that do this stuff every day. Um, dental labs are, are okay with this stuff, but dentures deal with it all the time. I, I have found a much higher degree of success when I send a small little repair to a denturist just because they're just that, that much better at it. Uh, some labs are good, but we just, the only removable lab we have in Maine that I know of is Port City. And um, I haven't worked with them in years. So anyways, it's, it's good, to, good to know how to handle these things. Uh, thank you, Chad. Yes. Uh, so there's a lot going on here. I, I think the, the patient that shows up with this, this is a beautiful opportunity to say, you have had all of these problems because of this, the way your system is set up. Would you like to change the trajectory of, of your problems moving forward? Um, basically letting them know that you don't have to always be coming back with tooth problems. We can actually set this up so that you, you have a stable dentition and you have a much lower risk of things happening. All right, so we'll, we'll refer back to this guy as we move forward. Uh, what I wanted to do was talk about several solutions several temporary solutions we could do for this guy. So there's basically two temporary modes. One is getting the guy a tooth today, but then there's the, let's get the guy a tooth for the period of time it's gonna take to remove this tooth and put an implant in. Um, again, there, there's an argument for this tooth to be saved. The downside would be if we did crown lengthening here, you're gonna have one tall tooth and one short tooth. Uh, with that said, I've definitely saved teeth like this in the past where I did crown lengthening, made sure the endo was good, put a new post in, new core and crown, and then I made damn sure that I adjusted the seclusion somehow, uh, like Dr. Labani had said in our uh, tech string, doing like an enamelplasty would be one technique, doing ortho, um, adding composite to this guy to help balance the forces. There's lots of things that we could do to mit mitigate the risk if we decided to save the tooth. Uh, topic for another day. So this is a sheet that a few of you guys have seen. It's what I call implants explained. This is for patients who uh, are gonna be going forward with implants, uh, specifically in the anterior. Uh, but there's a section of it that talks about the temporary solutions that patients will have in the meantime. So let's come over to this. So again, if, if you want a copy of this, I'm happy to share it with you. It's basically something that walks patients through all of the options that they have. So it talks about what happens if you don't uh, fill a space, teeth drift and move, they become uh, much more periodontally and occlusally unstable. Uh, then we go over all of the options, bridge, then an implant. We talk about the time frame involved. Basically, I took every single question a patient ever had and I just put it onto a sheet <laughs> and I give it to them every time I do an implant. Uh, implant expectation form. These are all of the things that I wanna make sure they understand, they initial here. You know, there's times we do an implant, we don't know if we need bone grafting. When we get in there, we need to, need to do bone grafting. Um, so all of these things bring me back to center to make sure that I have the conversations with these patients. Uh, but the, the relevant part of the conversation is this. So the last section of this implant essay for patients is what are the temporary options to fill the space in the meantime? Well, this is relevant for anybody with a space. It just, I have it, um, most clearly written in this document. Option one, do nothing, we've all seen that. Option two, the flipper, I like putting pictures in so patients can see it. Um, the Essex Pontic retainer, we can see here. The bonded bridge, we're gonna spend a little bit of time tonight talking about that. The temporary bridge, where we actually prep the adjacent teeth, whether they need crowns or not. Sometimes that's an option, especially if it's a comprehensive case. And then the sixth option is an immediate implant placement and immediate temporary. Um, I don't know how well this is taught in dental school because it's such a, such a new treatment option, but it's a very predictable treatment option. Putting the implant in immediately and then putting a temporary on it is, in, is a temporary option. Uh, so for those of you who refer to your oral surgeons, you know, I would find out, do they do this procedure where they remove the tooth and put the implant in right away? Some surgeons don't do it. Um, the science is very clear that we can do this very predictably. 
And there's an offshoot of this called the socket shield, which we'll talk about tonight. So again, this is a document I give the patients. Here is a summary of temporary options. This is something I had for myself in my early part of the career where I wanted to have one place where I could go, I could see the code, I could see how much it was. I had the pros and the cons so that I could articulate everything to the patient so that they understand what they're signing up for. But as you can see, there's a lot of different ways we can solve this, all the way down to that immediate implant. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to cover a few of these. Does anybody have any questions about this essay and how to use it? All right. Do you have access to it? Can you email it to us? I can. Um, I have a question. Sure. Do you typically try to talk patients out of the flipper if it's going over an implant just for fear of it, like compressing on the ridge? Or do you, like, what's your opinion on that? Yeah. Because um, our my surgeon that I typically work with, like, hate, like, royally hates them and does everything he can to talk them out of it. So I see no reason to ever do a flipper. And I, tr I try to not say that co in a condescending fashion. Um, how about this? Let's do the presentation. And then at the end, I think you'll get, you'll get the, the hint why. I think there's better solutions. And flippers put pressure on ridges, which is probably yeah. why your surgeon doesn't like it. Um, and then there's the obvious reason of patients don't like them. So that actually leads me to this here, which is a picture of a flipper. No, nobody wants that in their mouth. You know, we have patients that get flippers and they're like, oh my God, this is great. I can't believe I have a front tooth. Most patients are gonna have a hard time with it, but they don't know any different. We t if we tell the patient this is their only option, they're gonna do okay. But this isn't the only option. Um, this might be a bit bulky. I have used Valplast material for flippers in the past uh, before I really got good at what we're going to talk about in a second. Um, Valplast is lower profile. It hugs the teeth a little bit better. They're hard to adjust. You have to have a special kit for it. Uh, but I've had success with those non-acrylic based um, partials. With that said, the hope of today is to for everybody here to strongly consider not doing that. Um, there is a better way. So here are a couple kind of oddball solutions that I've seen over the years. I saved the photo, so I thought I'd bring them up. Uh, this is a, it's not a Maryland bridge. It's a, I'm not sure what, maybe it's an Idaho bridge or a Maine bridge. Uh, it's essentially just a temporary. So it's an acrylic tooth with these two wings and you put flowable around it to lock it in. Why are Maryland bridges not done anymore? They're very, very technique sensitive. So when we bond metal to tooth, the chemicals that we would use in the past, CNB Metabond, um, Parkell had th their version. Th there were several companies that specialized in these metal bonding agents. There were a lot of steps. And if you missed one step by a millisecond, the whole thing didn't work. It was very, very, very precise. Now, there were many clinicians that got very good at it, uh, but it took them a while to get there. In an era where dentistry is, you know, rush, 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 the idea of the Maryland Bridge is falling out of favor. So we really don't see this kind of solution that much anymore. Yes, zirconia can bond. I don't believe in zirconia bonding as a permanent solution or even a temporary solution at this point. Um, it can be done, it's been done well, but again, I, in the hands of the everyday clinician that you know, has other things going on in their life. Learning how to bond zirconia with predictability is not in the, the cards yet in dentistry. I don't think the materials have gotten there. We have um, nine MDP monomers that bond the metal. Just because something bonds doesn't mean it bonds well. So when we, when we see these zirconia primers that are intended to bond the wings of a Maryland bridge made out of zirconia and you, and you hear that it bonds, Ask them what the tensile strength is. Um, it's probably not above 10 megapascals. Um, it's getting better every day. I just don't think we're there. So we have to have other solutions in the, in the toolbox. 
Uh, this particular solution here uh, isn't necessarily a Maryland Bridge, but it's a patient that had a diastema, and for whatever reason, they bonded these two teeth together using a almost like a major connector that we would see on a partial. And then they had a lingual wing. My guess is this tooth was periodontally unstable, and they wanted to grab as much um, support as they could, but because of the spacing situation in the front, they didn't want to close the gap, otherwise the teeth would have looked too big. That's a solution. So always remember, you can work with your lab and come up with these unique ways to solving uh, prosthetic challenges. The prosthodontists are really good at that. You know, they, they, they know how to do these things uh, when the clinical situation presents itself. But I want to talk about something called the wire bonded provisional. So these photos here are taken from my good friend and mentor, Dan Armstrong. Uh, Dan Armstrong is a, was a, a practicing dentist. He's still around. Um, he just retired. Uh, but he was a general dentist that spent the greater part of his life perfecting his craft to the point where uh, he was seen as a prosthodontist almost, if not even more skilled than many prosthodontists. Um, he taught at Spear, and he has a lot of these novel ideas, and this is one of them. It's called the Wire Bonded Provisional. I've asked him, did he come up with it, and he always gives me some obscure answer. I do think he came up with this. If, if he didn't, uh, he's probably one person removed from the person who came up with it. So here we have a tooth. Now this tooth can be a denture tooth. It can be a glob of composite. It could be a milled resin crown. It could be the patient's actual tooth after extraction. Whatever it is, you get a, something that looks like a tooth. And then you find some sort of wire. Uh, I'm not sure where he got this wire. We use uh, the same wire that we, we use for um, ortho retention. Essentially, you just get a wire and you create a trough on the lingual of the tooth and you put composite over it making sure that the substrate of the tooth that you're using allows a good strong bond between flowable or packable composite and then you have these wings now what's unique about these wings is it's not like this this is a call that a plate a full plate the difference between this and this loop is super significant. This you can take off pretty easily with a 330 burr. Now there are many times, this, this is the whole, if you guys didn't pay attention, just pay attention to this one thing. When you do this, you're often doing it because there's an implant that goes in, there's some ridge augmentation that happens underneath, and we often need to get under the tooth. Now with a flipper, we can just take, take it out of the patient's mouth, but we're making the argument here that we wanna have something that's fixed but it needs to be somewhat removable. If we use something like a Maryland bridge and we bonded to it, you, you just have to cut the whole thing off and do a new one. This loop is what makes the difference because you can actually cut here and here, and then you take a little bit of tensile force and you snap it off and the whole thing comes off and then you clean up the glue around it, you clean up the glue on the tooth, you do your surgery underneath it and then you put it back on. Etch the tooth, bond, flowable, and you're good for another three to four months. This is so efficient. You have better control over the aesthetics because you can do it outside the mouth. Uh, we've used tints and all kinds of stains to characterize these. Um, it's absolutely amazing. So we, he calls it the wire bonded provisional. Uh, I think we're going to call it the Armstrong, Armstrong Pontic um, as soon as he tells me that he invented this. He came up with some really odd ideas, so I have no doubt that he contributed to this in some form or another. Uh, but this is it right here. This is what we do 90% of the time when we wanna do a provisional for a patient. There are times when we can't do this because of occlusion. You need to have the space in order to, order to do that. Uh, but oftentimes we create the space anyways from enamelplasty or ortho. Um, oftentimes when the patients are trapped, we want to untrap them anyways. But the retrievability of this is why it's key. If we're doing a ridge augmentation, an implant placement, an impression, we need to be able to have something that we can go in and remove it. The flipper has been the answer because the flipper is easy for the general dentist just to do all, all of those steps. Uh, but like Elena said, 
when we put pressure on a ridge, we're really limiting the amount of healing uh, that is possible for that kind of thing. Uh, so before I move on, does anybody have any thoughts, questions? Am I making this sound more amazing than it should be? Can you walk through how you pop it off again? Sure. So the what's holding it in is the composite that's sitting here and here. So you kind of break away with a 330 burr, the composite that sits around it. So I kind of come around. I'm basically removing the junction between the composite that's sitting between the, the metal rings and the ring itself or the metal itself. And once you get enough of it removed, you then take like a, we use a curved hemostats for our temporary crown removers and then I apply a force in this direction with a little bit of a twist and it pops off. So you basically just keep cutting it until you get enough composite out of the way. Um, it's really not that difficult. I can appreciate that it's hard to describe, um, but that's the gist of it. Well, you're not Rory. bonded on the canine, you're only bonded on the central. So this, that's a good question. He, I don't know why he did this. And when I was putting these photos together, um, I realized I've had these photos for a long time. I never looked at them with this much detail. Um, I think this has something to do with the fact that a few of you might know where I'm going with this. What's better, a two winged Maryland bridge or a one winged Maryland bridge with some lingual support? Second option. Yeah. So the reason is when we're chewing, the teeth are all moving, they're all flexing. Well, if it's bonded to two, when you bite here, you're gonna provide compression of the unit to the tooth here. But when you do that, you cause tensile, a reciprocating tensile force on the opposite wing. And that happens over the entire life cycle of the Maryland Bridge, which is why if you've ever seen a Maryland Bridge, more often than not, one wing is just sitting there. And if the patient has good hygiene, nothing bad happens. They don't even know it, 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 it debonded. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times there's decay underneath there and it's an absolute nightmare if that happens. But at some point in the past 25, 30 years, somebody figured out that you just need one wing and the other one you just need support so that as you're chewing this way, you get support. But as you chew on this tooth only and you get the reciprocating tensile forces, uh, this isn't bonded at all. And I, so I think that's why he did that. Uh, with that said, I've done, for these temporary situations, I've done two wings and I've, there's so much composite bonded here. These things don't go anywhere. I've never had one come off. I've never had one wing come off. And I've had them in there for, um, I don't know how long the longest one is, but it's definitely been longer than a year. I, I want to say maybe two years. That's so right. Temporary, you usually just do the one wing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Can you use an endophile to fabricate this? Like a 20 gauge or 15? Um, like I know you have ortho wire here. So you and I have used that for splinting traumatic teeth using an endo wire as a technique. Uh, a number eight or number 10 endo file is perfect for um, traumatically induced teeth. Uh, but in that case, we're, we're actually relying on movement to prevent ankylosis. I don't know if I would trust that too much. Now, could you do it? Sure, but I don't think that would be any different than just putting composite here. So one technique is literally just to bond it to the adjacent teeth and not have a wire at all. I've done that, but I've had failures uh, because of the fact that there's nothing rigid and the, the junction between the tooth and the adjacent teeth, the, the, the composite tends to fracture and then you end up having to redo it. Um, so I don't think that that wire would be strong enough to, to do that, but that's a great technique for the kid. That, you, yeah. The kid that came in, uh, floss used to be used for that, that manner. I didn't hear what you said. You're having these indirectly fabricated, right? By a lab. You can, uh, but we're going to go over, um, the more immediate version of this. Many of you guys have used rib on before and I have a really good case, uh, to show you, but this is something that's fabricated in the lab. Uh, Veronica does these. Veronica is a local lab technician. She used to work with Dan Armstrong. She made lots of them. She has a removable lab and she'll make these for you. She uses Radica, which is a very aesthetic, um, uh, methacrylate, I believe. 
um, that she can characterize to make it look really good, and she knows how to make these, these wings. Uh, there's all kinds of different ways to do it. I've used paper clips before that I've sterilized and created the loop. Um, I didn't find it was very easy to work with, but I have done it where I've just had a paper clip just straight across the front. That was a super short-term solution for a patient that needed something. Again, thinking outside the box. So I believe this is the tooth that Dan did. Here it looks like he did one where there was actually two, two pontic teeth. So he has the loop and then the, the straight arm. It looks like that one's not bonded, just like this one is not. I'll find out, I'll find out, did he bond that up this other side? I think the answer is no. I literally think you can put floss underneath there. It's, it's, it's only supporting um, occlusal forces in the facial direction. <clears throat> All right, well, we're running out of time. Uh, one thing I wanted to say is, <clears throat> talking about things being stable, he did this case here. Uh, this is one I've seen him present before. Uh, this was soft tissue grafting where he put this on so that the patient's periodontist could, could graft over the site and not have movement. You can't do this with a flipper. You can imagine how much nice tissue this site has now. He then went in and put an implant in, and if I can get that, that presentation was amazing. Um, you can see this was his temporary, so you can only imagine how the permanent came out. Uh, the point being that this is a technique to provide a stable solution, a stable scaffold for your periodontist. They would love this. A flipper is not a solution in, the, in this capacity, and as you can see, the option of doing a bridge here is just not an option. These teeth are perfectly fine. So I would be very scared to do that. But let's move forward to the Maryland, or sorry, the ribbon concept. So this is more of the emergency, let's get the patient something in the meantime. <clears throat> uh, so I wanted to share Luke's case that he did last week. So he called me up, he's like, I've got this lower tooth that needs to come out, what do I do? So this is what he, what I proposed he did. Uh, here's the tooth that needed to come out. Uh, I believe it was severely periodontally compromised. So what he did, he took the tooth out and he created a lingual sluice way or a slot or a trough. It's hard to see with these photos. Uh, he has, I believe he has better photos, but these were the ones taken with the intraoral camera. So I apologize about their quality. Uh, but you can see here from the the proximal view that there's a, he cut out a trough to lay down the rib on. You don't have to do this on the lower as much because this tooth was not in occlusion, but you really have to do this on the upper to create space for the restorative materials. Here he's showing uh, he had taken the tooth out. He cut off the bottom. We've talked about the ovate pontic in a few of our recent sessions, the power of the ovate pontic in being replaced immediately after extraction to help support the soft tissue and he was able to do that here. So here he just took an endophile to show that he was able to locate the underside of the canal. So what he did is he etched, bonded, and then added composite to the underside. So this is the underside of the tooth. The canal was right in the center here. Again he cut off the bottom half of the root. Then he made it into a bullet shape using composite. And then here he has rib bond. If you've never used rib bond, there's a certain bond that you have to use in order to um, kind of wet the surface of the, uh, the fibers. There's his extraction site. Now here he's preparing the adjacent teeth for the rib bond with some etch. And then here's the tooth back in place. Look how beautiful that is. You, you can't even tell that was ever removed out of the mouth because he preserved the root, created the ovate pontic, and then placed it back in. And here he is placing the, uh, the rib bond in place. That looks like it's cured. Uh, for those of us who have used rib bond, anytime you have these fibers, you got it, you got to remove them or cover it with composite. The patient's tongue would, it's like having floss between your teeth. It's very uncomfortable. As you can see, he's starting to add more and more flowable until it looks nice and adapted to the adjacent teeth. 
and the pontic, which was the patient's original tooth. So that's the post-op. Needless to say, he was pretty happy, you know, pretty pumped. Um, I think the notch that we saw in the beginning was an old composite that he cut out because he wanted to improve the aesthetics of it. So that's why we saw that first photo right here with that notch. So now the patient has soft tissue that's supported by a pontic that's under function and fixed. This tissue and this bone underneath it is going to be miles ahead of extraction and flipper or extraction and any other alternative. By having something pressed on the tissue and having the tissue then pressed on the underlying bone is a form of socket preservation. That's why we spent a lot of time over the past four weeks talking about the ovate pontic. The ovate pontic preserves ridges if you can clinically pull it off. So you need to have a situation where you can do this. We don't always have this opportunity, uh, but in this case, he definitely did. Anybody have any questions about Luke's awesome work? How do you code for that? Um, good question. Um, you know, I, I really wish the world of the CDT coding would come around to solving some of these problems. We use the splinting code and a four surface composite. So splinting, like if the patient had a periodontally compromised situation or traumatic, um, traumatically loosened tooth. We use Ribbon for that, so same code. It doesn't matter why something happens, the code is more about the execution, so we use that splinting code and then a four surface composite uh, because of the materials that we use to replace it, which covers for the, you know, cutting the tooth and putting composite on the underside. Um, anybody have any alternative coding solutions for this? I've done similar, or I'll just code it as fillings on the adjacent teeth. Yep. Since I'm like linking it to it. Yep. I think there there might be a code for like an interim pontic or something like that. Um, uh, there, and I can I can there, there find is. that out. Um, there's a pontic code, resin pontic code. That probably is the most accurate. Um, let's go back to the, this guy here. What did, what did Luke code it as? What you just said, the a splinted? Um, I gave him Sorry, a copy. Dr. Dr. Libby. It, it's fine. Um, I gave him this here and in our, um, in our office, we have a spe specific code, which is D6999B which is specifically for it. We have a fee. So in our office, we have a code specifically for this procedure, um, but you have to go into your software and create that code. And then in the past, I've sent an explanation to the insurance companies to try to get some coverage, which typically they don't cover much. They don't like these, these codes here. Uh, but that might be a better way, Dr. Greenbaum. I, I will totally take you up on that. I think the resin pontic is a code and then splinting of the adjacent teeth might be the most accurate way to go about it. Um, again, insurance companies don't cover these anyway, so I, I've, you can see why I'm a little bit less knowledgeable in the world of coding, because it doesn't matter, <laughs> uh, as long as it's somewhat representable of what you did. No board's gonna give you a hard time about it, hopefully. Uh, I have a question about the material choice. Yeah. Um, so, is there a reason to go with resin for the underside? I just know that I I have minimal experience with this, but the couple of procedures that I did, like with periodontists, where it came to restorative next to grafting or bone healing and things like that, they were partial to GI. Um, so I didn't know if it actually really made a difference in this situation. Yeah, yeah, I mean, glass ionomer is definitely a better, it's more biologic material than resin. Um, I've been in rooms where periodontists have that argument of how cytotoxic resin is to fibroblasts. Um, there is a, a fair degree of research to support that that's the case. Um, but in this particular situation where everything is mostly super gingival, I, I can't imagine there would be a relevance here. 
Um, I've made ovate pontics underneath bridges that I've had periodontists graft and they graft right over it and it's been fine. Um, so I, I don't have the exact answer to that. I do know that if you were doing something subgingival, that glass ionomer is better. I mean, that's, we know that margin elevation, open sandwich technique, what have you, all of those techniques take advantage of the fact that glass ionomer is more bioactive than, than resin. I wouldn't say more bioactive, it's less cytotoxic. Uh, bioactive would imply that there's some sort of biological process that happens with the glass ionomer, with soft tissue. Um, stuff like Activa, those are bioactive materials, quote unquote, bi bioactive. So, yeah, I, I would talk to the periodontist to make sure that they're part of that decision-making process, but I, it's not something I would lose a whole lot of sleep over in the realm of super gingival um, temporary situations. Got it. Yeah. Question, Dr. Roy, for Ovate Pontix. Yes. Um, I think I was listening to a Glidewell lecture series video, and they were recommending making the Ovate Pontic be subgingival by four to six millimeters. Is that, I mean, I, I feel like that's a detail that's very overshadowed when we just say make an ovate pontic. Yep. Is that kind of the the ramp up that we need is really four to six millimeters? Because that seems really significant. Well, if we think about what was there before, there was a root that was 20 millimeters long. Now, I'm obviously kind of over overstating it. I, I agree with where your head's at. It seems like it's pretty a pretty significant um, depth underneath underneath the tissue but it's bullet shaped in nature where the the highest point is at the center and then it graduates towards the cervical margin of, of the tooth um, so it's not like the whole thing is that deep um, a lot of it also has to do with the bone that's underneath it so obviously you can't go super deep if the bony architecture doesn't allow you to do that uh, but four millimeters isn't isn't that significant. Um, I used to do two, and then I went to three, and then I went to four, and then I came across something that said that four to six. So I'm guessing Glidewell probably read that. And ever since then, I've been much more aggressive with it, uh, and they come out even better. It's it's amazing. It has more to do with the underlying bone than anything. But a lot of times, when you extract these teeth, there there's minimal bone to begin with. But by preserving the soft tissue, by having that ovate pontic, you're giving the healing socket something to rest up against as it heals. Six millimeters is fine. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question other than I, I totally agree with what they said. It's just, it seems like a lot when you read it. Yeah, no, yeah. that was just, just confirmation. Yep. All right. Well, we're going to get cut out in a second. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I wanted to go over the socket shield. We'll save that for another day. Uh, just know that in the future, you're going to see uh, surgeons, periodontists, general dentists leaving a sliver of tooth on the facial surface adjacent to the bundle bone. Um, I just want to show the case that we've done several of them, uh, but this is one that I did recently. Uh, I want to publish it because there's there were some unique parts of it. I'm actually redoing the crown because I didn't like the the yellowness here. Uh, but this is what a socket shield can do. You can see how the Sharpie's fibers are still intact. There was no loss of soft tissue. This has been in the patient's mouth for a year and a half, two years, as is. Uh, at some point, I'm going to take this all apart. But I have a whole presentation on the socket shield. But that's more of a surgical technique that I know some of us don't do surgery, so I don't want to belabor people. I just want people to know that it's becoming something. So when you hear of it, it's not a dentist being sloppy. It's actually an advanced technique that preserves buckle plates that I guarantee will be part of the future of surgery. So on that note, hopefully everybody stays cool. Have a good Monday night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. And I'll send out the email to everybody with the uh, document.